Hello there YouTube community, uh, fans of my channel, I'm Brandon Bailey here on uh, behalf of a request from either my mother or her boyfriend Tyler. Not really sure, they share both accounts, but they requested I review some Smashing Pumpkins today. So here I am for all you Smashing Pumpkins fans to review their uh, second to latest album they have out. It's called Shiny and Oh So Bright Volume 1. It's a LP. And it has like a subtitle, no past, no future, no sun, which are all, they all seem to be like prevalent themes on the album here. And um, I did a little bit of research going into this because I've said before in a, I think the Killers video that like doing new albums, like when you're reviewing them, sometimes it's kind of hard to find the information that you want, like as far as like how the record was made. Like, obviously, you usually got, like, a lot of people commenting about, like, what lyrics mean and that sort of thing, but getting, like, anecdotal evidence of the album and things that happened is, I don't know, just not as documented as things were, like, decades ago, you know, like, bands from the 60s and 70s and maybe, like, the 80s even a little bit, like, you usually have a lot of documentation of how things went and stuff like that. Luckily, there was a little bit with this, and um, I can tell that he really wanted to stress the LP thing, Billy Corgan wanted to stress the LP thing on this, which is, uh, I get it, you know, it does kind of feel like a shorter, like, more old, an older, like, album you would get on vinyl because there was less, like, play time on it, you know what I mean? Like, it, it kind of feels like one of those old, like, Zeppelin or, like, Rush albums where, like, you only had, like, nine or ten songs because of the sides and how much you could fit on them. Either that or you had even less you know, with like longer songs on them and stuff. So uh, I think that's what they were going for. Also, it's good to point out that um, all these songs were like written without really having the album in mind. And then apparently they brought it to producer Rick Rubin, who they worked with at his uh, Shangri-La studios out in Malibu in California. Um, he accepted all the songs, they didn't think he was going to accept all the songs, and they kind of just felt like their own entity, and that's kind of why he, uh, put it out as an LP, so to speak, you know, it, it's still a studio album, but it's not an EP, and it's not like a compilation, really. It is, it's a compilation of songs from the same period, but he just felt like they didn't conceptually fit in like most of their other albums do. Kind of get it. He's kind of stressing it a lot, though, <laughs> but, you know, it's okay. Like, I think it's a pretty uh, decent batch of songs here, man. So, looking at the uh, chart positions here before we get into this, uh, looks like got the highest one at UK Independent Albums at 3 on the chart there, US Independent Albums at 2, and it got the year-end U.S. Independent Albums on Billboard at 43, and then we got the Top Alternative Albums at 8, and then Top Rock Albums for the U.S., this is all Billboard here, is number 10. So that's not too bad for a new, um, new Smashing Pumpkins record, really. I actually wasn't aware that it, it uh, did that well, though I do kind of remember hearing Solero on the radio a bit, but we'll get into that. So... The album was recorded February to June 2018, and then finally released in November 16th, 2018. And I bought this thing, like, right as it came out, actually. I remember hearing about it, and then I went into FYE to look for CDs, and this was, like, right there, and it was, like, on sale. So, picked this up as soon as it came out, and, um, get into the track review here. First track, Knights of Malta, it opens with this elegant string and piano intro, Billy comes in with the chorus before the verse kicks in, the bass is nice during the verse, everything is locked in tight, I love the Pink Floyd-esque backing vocals, the pre-chorus with its open airy chords is nice. The guitar feedback that turns into the back mask solo is, is so cool and like weird for them. Like they always do like weird solos, but th that one like so so simple. It just rips open like the space-time continuum of this song like out of nowhere. 
and then drops back out for another verse, getting right back into it. And, um, yeah, the lyrics, um, for a lot of this album, probably going to say this, and a lot of other albums in general, in the future, it ha it seems to deal with, like, these mythological symbolisms that I know he always tries to set up uh, lyrically and with the themes on this. Uh, you know, it's they seem very hopeful and uplifting, and uh, the bridge lyrics are pretty interesting, and it all builds up into the, the final chorus where everything comes in more flourishing and everything than it was before in the song. And the lyrics, um, you know, they seem to deal with, like, secret societies in a way. Like, I, I don't know, I'm not trying to say any of this for sure, but the, it seems like it's likely referring to the actual Knights of Malta, which was like a, a organization, a religious organization. And... It just seems like he might be using that as like his own metaphor for what's going on in the band or what he wants to project with these like the symbolism, all these secret societies and stuff. It also seems to deal with, you know, the Knights of Malta is like religious, so and he said that he got a little um, religious on this album, so it kind of makes sense. I actually didn't really know that about him prior, like, to being a Smashing Pumpkins fan, but like. It, you know, it's not like any of these things come off like trying to shove them down your throat or anything. It just seems like he's trying to find his own thing. And he's using some of that symbolism and the metaphors and stuff in his output on here. So then the next song, probably my favorite on here. It's hard to say. I have another one that's pretty close, but this one is just so nice. Um, I love the guitar tones on it and stuff. It kicks right in with the upbeat riff of the song. Love the spacey background chords on it. It has sort of a reminiscent feel of like 1979 with like the tempo of it and just the guitar tone. His vocal delivery is pretty unique though compared to his other like voices that he has in the band on this one. It's just I don't know, it just sounds like he was just being him, just letting the, his voice naturally flow out instead of like trying to force any one singular sound. And the, I love the lead guitar tones, you know, that's like <laughs> probably my favorite part about this. They're just so different, and I think they really modernize like their sound with the guitar on this album a lot. The song is a very emotional feel, but very catchy. The solo after the second chorus is my favorite on the album. It's a... Uh, you know, all the sol guitar solos that happen on here are kind of, like, simple. You know, they're definitely not as, like, crazy or flashy with effects or anything like that, like most of their other albums have been in the past, but I love how melodic they are. They're just l nice little touches to the song, and the effects and tones that they do have on, especially this one, I don't know, it's just different, very different for them, and I, it stands out. It makes the song stand out amongst other ones on here to me. The tone, it just cuts right through so well. It's so simple, yet it makes the song stand out. The extra bend of the lead guitar during that final chorus, too, uh, it's just it's just crazy. It does, They just do this build-up during the... We're in the middle part, and he just does this... It's... Uh, Goddamn, just makes it scream. Good stuff. So the lyrics... I had to like research like most of the lyrics on this album just to wrap my head around it because that's just how Billy Corgan is. It uh, there's a juxtaposition of the lyrical themes and wordplay in this one. I I feel like perhaps it's like creating some sort of purgatorial metaphorical place in a way. Uh, it seems like he's talking about someone exerting rage a lot but it could be about himself like as well it sounds like it's meant for a significant other um in a way there's lines in it like it's your signals that hurt me the most you know so it sounds like even though it's like an emotional kind of softer song it kind of feels like he's talking about regret uh, or he's saying that someone else has regret or something it's, it just comes along those lines to me um about hurting someone in a relationship the wordplay kind of has like a sort of like John Lennon-esque confusion vibe though, which is something I get from pretty much all of his <laughs> lyrics to a certain extent, unless they're very, they're meant to be cut and dry. Like I feel like he's just 
very influenced by that in the sense that he just doesn't really care whether you understand exactly what the hell he's trying to say. He's just, you know, painting the picture that he is, and uh, it's open to interpretation, and if you don't get the mythological elements that he's been throwing out since Gish, then you, n you pretty much never will. But, um, you're likely not supposed to get the meaning of every line unless you know the band personally is how I feel. Lots of like inside references and just different kind of mythological things. So, Travels, the next song. This one is uh, very good as well. This isn't the one that I had as a runner-up for Ghosts, but um, it's still like an equally... It's like on the same level as that song and they're done just equally as well as one another. Just a, isn't my favorite like that one is. I like the meaning of the other one. But this one, it opens up with the tom beat and the guitar riff coming in together. So spacey again, and uh, sounds so nice. His lyrics are very deep here, and the song has a melancholic vibe. Love how the bass sounds. It's just chugging along there. The chorus is catchy. Sounds like he's traveling on the road or just about feeling like an outsider everywhere he goes just because you know what we do as musicians especially in rock bands um short guitar solo after the first chorus is cool it pairs up with the string section like they kind of tie together in a way it sounds really nice it uh, really adds a sort of like Weezer-esque melody like for a brief period like uh, just the the melody of how it carries along like it's just so catchy and everything and just the way the strings and the guitar tie together for it it really really makes stand out in a weird way for the pumpkins here it happens again after the second chorus into a bridge that ascends the chorus into a middle eight section leading back into another verse i love the suspended chords that are used throughout all this song too like the just so many like interesting uh voicings going on which there usually are for them. They're like the kings of using inversions and combining chords together. So the crashing of the background guitars too during that final verse are a nice touch. They just mm, just come exploding through the speakers in the background though. Like they come exploding through, but they're like just like this distant like like uh, it's awesome. The drum beat gets more and more intense towards the end. Uh, it ends on like this uplifting major chord too, like half the songs like in this melancholy feel, but then it just ends on this happy note out of nowhere. And from what I understand, speaking of those drums getting more intense at the end, uh, they apparently this was the one they apparently had Rick Rubin like trim down the most fat off of or something. They had they apparently had this whole big arrangement for this song that was even more grandiose than how it was on here. And Rick Rubin kind of saw like it going to a more stripped down and more laid back place, I guess. Something more catchy. So, I don't know. Whatever he did, it seemed to work and seemed to build it up pretty well. Uh, let's see. The next song, the big single off the album, Solera. Like I said, I kind of remember this one coming out on the radio a few years ago, back when, before this album was released, and I was just kind of like blown away, you know, Oceana had been out. That album, I mean, it has its moments, but, like, it doesn't have, like, that old-school, like, kind of grittiness that the Pumpkins used to have. And, like, as soon as I heard Solera come in with the riff, I was like, oh, shit, they're bringing, bringing the distortion back in their game. I haven't really heard that stuff since, like, Zeitgeist, you know, like, Tarantula, songs like that. They weren't really about it. Maybe it just was going for a different vibe. So it comes in right along, like I said, with that chugging guitar and uh, Billy's vocal melody just kind of floating above the rhythm of the song, as he usually does. The, my favorite singers usually do that sort of thing. They know how to just pick out this this line that it, it's, you know, it's not matching the guitar riff, it's not matching the drums or anything, it just kind of is there, you know, and there's his own melody that just floats in the key of the song. And, uh... The drum groove comes in nice when the chorus finally kicks in and just goes into high gear. His chorus vocal delivery sort of reminds me of, like, Andrew Stockdale from Wolfmother for some reason here. I don't know what it is. It's just unusual for him. He, they go for all these different 
voices and tones on this album and uh right here he just gets into that i don't know if it's just because he's getting old trying to do his old nasally like kind of delivery but it really does remind me of andrew stockdale here just that burn down the sun and like like wow i never heard him do something like that so the way the chorus chords ring out it sounds so cool that they just let it like feed back and then the drums do these crazy snare rolls that just so like offbeat but just lead you back into the verse again then there's these like background guitar tones that are freaking overlaid in there it just sounds like they're trying to represent strings with guitars which is always fun i do that similar thing sometimes tones the riff riff tones are so nice though they're very fuzzy and it's like they're not like a, like sound like a metal zone pedal you know just like you know they're just nice and like chin, 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 you know just tight they're just so tight the build up into the bridge is pretty awesome the bridge gets nuts with all the drums like jimmy he's really letting it out here the riff is super like i said zero like tarantula like kind of ask for them X Y U those kind of songs it, it, and it's different because they haven't really been touching on that a lot in recent years and it'll come up a couple times on this one so he's in a like I said about that subtitle they have on here like he's bringing up the Sun topic obviously the songs called Solera so that's like a reference to stars in the first place but yeah, it's just like there's some sort of a metaphor going on with the the sun here. I'm not really, you know, I try to wrap my head around it as much as possible. You know, like I said, he he's not really intending for you to understand exactly where these songs are coming from. So uh, the final verse gets a little more dramatic with the vocal delivery, and it abruptly ends after the last chorus. It just bam cuts out. The lyric. Uh, it seems to be about the sun eventually killing everything or something, someone stealing the sun energy or something. Like a, I don't know, like a Dyson sphere or something. <laughs> Not really sure. Either way, it sounds like something in reference to the album title with the no sun thing, like I was saying. Again, the sun could be metaphorical, like representation of something else. Like something else going on in Billy's life at the moment or the band's life he sounds like a, a ruthless like commander in the lyrics though like you know just exclaiming uh, to do like something impossible like uh, bring down the sun burn down the sun you know what I mean like uh, some, it's confusing wondering what thoughts he's like trying to provoke on this song but they're they're pretty heavy and it just sounds like he's just some sort of military commander like trying to tell you to <laughs> destroy the sun or something uh, it's strange strange song lyrically sure it has some sort of uh, representation though so in the next song alienation I like this one a lot too an ominous synth opens it up, which is like kind of different from some of the other songs on here. Some of the most of the songs kind of start with the drums and the guitar, or the vocals and guitar in a way, or piano and guitar. <laughs> this one just has like a creepy synth thing that opens it up, and then it comes in with these piano lines, which are really nice. A little like just these little extra touches effects going on in there, like production tricks. The vocals and drums come in, put pulsing together. His vocals sit nicely on top of the the simple instrumental going on again. The vibe has a very like cinematic, like superhero movie like kind of feel. Like I feel like when he was writing the chord progression to this, he was like watching like a DC movie or something like DC Comics or something like that. It just <laughs> has that dark but like heroic kind of feel to it as as like lo-fi as the song kind of is after the first um chorus there's like this ebo it sounds like an ebo they're using to me anyway i mean i guess with the effects nowadays you could probably recreate it with whatever but uh it sounds like he's using an ebo for this little solo that comes after the first chorus it sounds so nice 
very different for them again. Sounds like it would normally be like synth strings they're trying to do, but it's a guitar solo. The acoustic guitar and his bouncy vocal melody um, bring the second verse into a unique place. Like he just changes up the feel of it and this delivery. Like it's pretty cool. Pretty cool to see a singer do that. Another short lead part after the second chorus ascends into the bridge. And then the verse, the final build up into the last chorus is pretty nice. I love how spacey it all is. And the last bend that trails off into the final chorus is pretty cool. It's like this guitar bend. Jimmy just rolls his snare super fast into a more intense groove for the final chorus. Really cool. His lyrics serve as like a coda yeah with the of the I sing thing going on there it kind of just repeats it and then it's just the piano and synth like fading out distantly in the the outro it's really nice really gives it I know the song's kind of about like um alienation like in a personal sense or like in a societal sense like with people being alienated maybe with technology but it really the end how it fades out like that really gives it like the sci-fi feel that or like you know like i said like the cinematic like sort of feel that they don't really have all the time you know it's interesting not a lot of rock bands do that honestly with their chord progressions the lyrics seem to directly play with the definition of alienation though in uh, many different ways sounds like it's just a lot of wordplay going on sounds like he's speaking of living your life antisocial or alone or exiled from society in some way due to your own beliefs or like technology and then finding that it like wasn't worth sticking you know to being just by yourself in the end like you always need someone maybe about how people are so dependent on stuff these days um, doesn't allow people to come out of their shell or even leave their homes which is like kinda of some of the literal surface themes that I kinda of get off of this um, alright so three more here uh, this is the one that's like a runner-up for my favorite on the album uh, for uh, Silvery Sometimes this next track marching on probably one of their heaviest freaking songs period there's like very few songs they have that to me like get to this level um, it just smacks you right in the face as soon as it comes in everything just comes in all at once it's all heavy and then a lead with like this spacey tone comes off of it just screaming at you and then the verse kicks in and his vocal delivery is pretty awesome sort of like the heavy songs on melancholy and the infinite sadness like I was saying before with Solera like Kind of just reminds me of like some Zero, XYU, um, Tales of a Scorched Earth, like sort of vibe. The pre-chorus is cool. The lead sounds like big strings, like, turned into like heavy guitars. It's like, it's super, super crazy. They do that a lot on this. They like take what would be like string lines for me normally and just make them into screaming guitar tones. It's awesome. The chorus gets into a big groove the way the guitar squeals into the bridge off of that is pretty awesome it just does uh, I don't even know how to describe the way that it sounds it sounds like super synthy but it just does this very like digital but not in a bad way like kind of effect where it's just like <laughs> like it just uh, just explodes with all this energy out of freaking nowhere and then you know, of course, the bridge is awesome itself. The drums just are freaking pounding on it, and it, uh, the riff with that matched up with it sort of reminds me of like a Rammstein like esque sort of vibe. You know what I mean? Like it's just with the heaviness and the chugging of it. The final chorus has this machine like guitar that comes in with it's just like woo, just ah man, it it really makes the song like. Uh, Silvery is nice, like, it has, like, all these nice vibes that I really like out of the Pumpkins, pretty much why I love them, but, like, when you hear them do surprising songs like this, and there's just, like, these little things about it like that, like that little lead guitar that comes in at the end, it just, goddamn, you just want more of that shit, it sounds so cool. The final chorus, with that thing, um, 
ends pretty abruptly with a little short smack in the face to lead it out. Like, it just goes, bam, done before you know it. It's one of the shortest songs on the album, as much as, like, has it has so much packed into it. It's pretty cool. This song is more puzzling lyrics, though. Sounds like he's talking about the struggles you may face in a relationship. Uh, you know, marching on, being the title and stuff. But they make you stronger as you go. Like, a what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, like, kind of vibe. Sounds like he's uh, talking about a woman holding power in some way. Yeah. I don't know if that's necessarily referring to a relationship or just empowerment in general. Not really sure. And, uh... You're just a witness, as uh, he says. <laughs> uh, there may be more mythological or metaphorical undertones with a lot of the symbolism and imagery in the lyrics, but uh, it probably is personal to him from what I can understand. There's a lot of like angst and like pent-up energy I'm feeling in this song, so probably along those lines. So the next track, With Sympathy opens with these very melancholic chords and this simple drum beat. Then the spacey layers come in with a beautiful chord progression for the verse. His vocals are beautiful in this song. I love how the bells like come in during the pre-chorus too. It's very um, different for them. There's like these little chimey vibraphone, xylophone, something like that in there. Uh, his chorus vocals are very soulful for him. It's probably one of the most soulful deliveries he's given, uh, like ever. I love the little background voices that pop in too. They're, they're just like, just come in in these little sparse moments here and there. And the lead guitar tone during the chorus is really cool again. They just add in another interesting light texture for them. The outro with the drums just pumping, you know, its beat, and then the, the open guitar chords around it, it just creates this an another atmospheric, spacey kind of sound. Feels like an ocean, like kind of washing over you in the end. Another song on here that seems to deal with faith and his, like, Christianity in particular, because, you know, after watching interviews, him kind of delving into that a little bit with what the themes are here in particular with the line about uh the seraphim he just brings up these uh creatures that are like sort of like biblical mythological like ancient um beings that he talks about but i think he, he's using them in a metaphorical sense it's very coded uh it may be a love song about accepting your partner through all the struggles of a relationship um, just like the last song kind of was, but this one obviously is a softer song, you know, with sympathy. Kind of comes from a more honest place, I guess. Uh, I don't know, I'm not really sure exactly, again. Um, not really sure where his reference of the Irishman. Maybe it has a little bit to do with the movie that came out at that time on Netflix or whatever, but I'm not really sure. He mentions Irishman and Ivy in the song. Probably just more underlying concepts. Alright, so we're moving to the last track on the album here. This short 8-track album. <laughs> Still reaches about like a little over 30 minutes though. So you can consider it an album, Billy. Don't, don't lie. Don't lie to me, boy. Seeking You Shall Destroy, though. Um, another one that just has this heaviness that hits you out of nowhere for them in these uh, recent Smashing Pumpkin times here. It opens right off the bat with this bouncy groove and main heavy riff that goes throughout most of the song. Um, the drums are awesome again. The chorus builds up more intensely with every pass through until it all like kind of fizzles out. I love the unique song structure at play in this one too. Like it doesn't have a normal verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge or like even with the pre-chorus in between. It just kind of throws stuff in and takes you on this trip, you know, throughout it. The riff leading back into the verse is pretty heavy too. His vocal melody, again, sitting on top of everything. has a nice flow, pretty smooth. The guitar lead that comes in right before the last chorus 
is like heroic sounding in the background and like has more of these like big um I don't want to say like power metal but like just uh I don't know just uh, anthemic almost sounding not necessarily like cinematic like alienation was but like they're just like super big anthemic heroic tones going on the beat drops out for a second for a breather like it just gives a little bit of space right before it ends the song with a more climb up on the main riff like a little bit like the guitars build up on each note of the scale with uh, each pass through of the riff and to silence as the song ends the song just drops out in the silence and then it's over so it's a uh, lyrically more seemingly conceptual stuff with lots of old world like Christianity references like the song before it again it sounds like a lot of what's being projected is guilt of doing wrong in the past or admitting you've done like immoral things that don't um, make you seem to be worthy in some way there may be more illusions here like to just secrecy and symbolism with secret societies and religious organizations which uh, though that seems weird for Billy to do considering you know he's admittedly a Christian believer so why would he be criticizing what he believes in so intently uh, though I don't blame him because there is a lot of stuff wrong in these big religious organizations especially within secret societies and stuff it does kind of seem like he's saying if you look to uncover the secrets of his world or these worlds and find out the meanings uh, buried within, then you're likely or unjustifiably able to find something that breaks it down and uh, sees it for all its faults and all its, all its glory and whatnot. Not really sure, though. That's just kind of what I get out of the title being Seek and You Shall Destroy. It just has that sort of vibe, like he's just like, try to find out what these lyrics are about, man. And you will uh, you will surely succeed in tearing <laughs> down any belief you had prior about him. So we're going to get into rating the album, as I do here at the end. So production quality. We're talking about Rick Rubin here. One of my all-time favorite, like, famous producers. Like, for real, like historically he's just worked with everyone that I like he's made killer albums for like everyone that I like every time he seems to like like because he'll be there sometimes for like the beginning of a band like Slayer or something like that but then he'll do these things where he'll come in like when a band like really needs like this revitalization in a way to like kind of find something new feel like another good example of that producer wise like danger mouse though he can be hit or miss with how it comes off how he changes a band sound but think about like the black keys when he came into that it just like he added this whole new depth and element to the production when he stepped in on them and uh, rick rubin same with everything he comes in a band has the sound and he knows how to make that work but also take it to another level that's you know it seems like there's progress going on you know that's a be that's the best thing you can do in a band with albums in my opinion is make it seem like you're making progress with each album like not really backtracking in a bad way or trying to just like relive the past and that sort of thing if if you can improve on your efforts with each output that you have that that means that your discography is going pretty damn well all righty so that being said because there's just so many things I love about like what's going on here. I mean, you got James Eha. I mean, I think there's like three guitar players on this, but James Eha, their original guitar player, came back on this. You can just tell how much they were having fun with messing around with the guitars on this. Uh, so cool, man! Uh, like all the tricks that Rick Rubin and all them bust out through all these songs is just. Mind-blowing stuff for them. It just sounds modernized and really cool. Like, never in a bad way to me. Like, this this rubs me in all the right ways. So I'll have to give production quality a five. 
Rick Rubin, you're the man. Uh, cohesion here. Now this is where we might get a little rocky, only because, like I was saying in the beginning about the LP thing, the songs were never really meant to be like a cohesive album, like he's saying. They're kind of just like a collection of songs in a way that they wrote, and I guess maybe we're planning to release as separate EPs. I think it was like two separate four-track EPs or something like that. And then I guess the project just grew out of the proportion that they originally had and it became a studio album. And uh, I'm glad it did because I can get everything all in one here. Even though I kind of hope that he touches on a volume two at some point. Don't know if that's ever going to happen considering they've already put out another album. But you never know with them. Billy's always got something cooking up. And um, yeah, so the cohesion, it was not never really meant to be cohesive. Though I feel like it has like these mixture of like these spacey, kind of softer, ballady, poppy songs, but also has the heavy moments that they used to have a lot in their stuff. And there's like this 50 50 split with all that, with not much in between. And um, as juxtaposed as they come off, I mean, I feel like Rick Rubin's production makes it cohesive on it, so it doesn't really. Weigh it down, I won't say that it feels like Gish or Siamese Dream. Even, I mean, he says that Ava Adore, that album, was like the same thing as this, just kind of a collection of songs, but even that has more of like a cohesive, similar tone and vibe going on it compared to here. And I definitely am not going to use Melancholy as an example of cohesion because... It's a double album with like everything under the sun on it, so that that definitely doesn't justify <laughs> as cohesive as like the white album. So this one, kind of like that, though it's a little more cohesive than past efforts, just because of Rick Rubin. I feel like, and the fact that the songs came from a similar era and vibe with them. But with that being said, I'm gonna give Cohesion a four. On this, I'll, I'll take off one star just for, you know, not really a lack of focus, but no concept like there usually is for them. At least uh, not an album's worth of a concept. Let's see, the audience here. I mean, Smashing Pumpkins been around for the, the late 80s now, and... You know, they have, they definitely have their following, you know, everyone who grew up with them, uh, I'm like a 90s baby, and apparently this was like the first thing my mom claims uh, was like my favorite band when I was like three to like five years old, <laughs> I was like a, a toddler, and she said, and when I got older, she was like, man, Smashing Pumpkins used to be your favorite band, and I was like, really? That's crazy. But, I mean, I guess it does, it makes sense, you know, there's a lot of this stuff going on on the radio, MTV when I was a kid back in the 90s so makes sense so that being said their audience uh, much as I feel like they've kinda lost some of their core audience from probably melancholy on just because Ava Adore was that album was kind of like I don't know like a little more mainstreamy I guess like just kind of darker. I personally love most of their output, and especially that album, so I don't really, um, don't really understand why anybody would, but yeah, I've noticed that a lot of people just kind of drop off after Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, and just kind of thought he got super weird, like after the lineup changes happened and everything, but I mean, personally, it's, it's Billy Corgan singing, so it's all Smashing Pumpkins to me, and Jimmy's been on drums for virtually like 90% of their output so same with James he was on most of the albums still just Darcy uh, left the band but great great stuff in my opinion still I think that they're going for a newer audience trying to bring in newer fans by accepting that they can change um, their tones around their style a bit and uh, they still have the same, like uh, I've said a million times already in this, like the mythological, like conceptual, lyrical themes here, and even stuff that harkens back to 
older tones, like ghosts kind of sounding reminiscent of like 1979 a bit. Like they had their little motifs and things that pop up here. So not a hundred percent different from anything else they've really done. But considering the past stuff and them trying to bring this back, I'm going to have to give the audience on this a 4.5 because maybe he wasn't going for anything in particular. But I do think that they probably won a bunch of new fans back over and probably their older crowd with this one, even versus Oceana, because it's just, just more like their old, old output with more new touches in. I love it. <clears throat> so the instrumental skills and lyrical content on the album I mean fuck with their with their skills you can never go wrong I mean they're all like some of the best uh, musicians to ever get into hard rock and alternative rock and power pop kind of sound um just so unique with all their playing, the way they can all complement each other with everything. I, and in my opinion, don't kill me, Billy Corgan, but Jimmy, the drummer, has always been like the unsung hero of the band. Like from the beginning on, like I just the thing that always drives me to all my favorite songs probably the most is just how fucking nuts the drums are for some of these songs that. You know, you wouldn't even think the drums would be that crazy, but, like, they just are. And when you watch them live, like, he just usually speeds their songs up, like, double time and fucking just goes even crazier. It's like, where's the where's this dude's energy come from? It's like Charlie Benante from Anthrax. They're just both, like, fucking powerhouses, dude. They just don't stop playing fast. Not that they can't play contained and slow, too, but the songs that are fast, they're just breakneck speed so and that's that goes to say for all the heavy songs on here and then all the songs that are even a little more stripped back he you can just tell how tight of a drummer he is he just plays the right beat um probably did exactly what billy and rick rubin were feeling on the songs and makes them stand out and then the bass lines on here really um, punch through. The guitar tones, like I said a million times already, are so unique for them. Kind of sound modern, like they're trying to push boundaries and make new stuff happen. It's really nice. I, I like all their skills. There's nothing super flashy on here, aside from just the tightness of their playing and using like kind of different chords and shit like that, and the effects and stuff. But the solos, they're just really melodic. The singing's really soulful for him. And I guess maybe a little bit like nasally, like his old tones at, at, in the heavy songs, but still like just so catchy and earwormy throughout it. So instrumental skills are great. The lyrical content, on the other hand, is the more quizzical thing because like, you know, you're not, you're not really meant to like get every single word and line that he's throwing at you here. And if you do, you're, I mean, you gotta like be really in with the band, I feel like, but on that note, he does it really well. Like, you know, I don't get, like, mad sitting here trying to decipher stuff, or I don't get, like, so confused. I get, like, a migraine thinking about it. It's just, I don't know, uh, hard to decipher. So I'm not going to let that hurt my scoring of it in any way because some of my favorite bands are like that when they use metaphors and just they know how to confuse you in all the right ways and still make a catchy song. So... Five out of five, instrumental skills, lyrical content, can't complain with the Smashing Pumpkins on this one. Though, it's eight songs, so, you know, you get, you get so much out of it. Alright, now time for my personal experience and story with the album, which is really cool. I actually kind of got deja vu just talking about it right now, but, um... I remember me and my buddy, Zach Brown, he's an ex and the Dukes member... Uh, Dawn of a People member. Uh, I have been trying to work with him on some solo stuff. He's done stuff with me before. He's a good, great skateboarder. Me, him and I, um, we went out to the mall for my birthday, I think, and watched a movie or some shit like that. And like I said, I went to FYE, and you know, we just kind of checked out some music and stuff. And I was 
totally a fan of Solero on the radio, and so when I went in there and saw this, like, it was like 10 bucks on sale, like, right up front <laughs> on the rock uh, music part of there, and then um, I was just like, yeah, that's a no-brainer, I'm picking that one up for sure. And then this was like the first thing, I think I bought like three or four albums that day, and this was like the first one, Zach and I popped in his car radio, and like, it was like a rainy day too, so it like, kind of fit the vibe for the album in a way, like it was just like this dark, moody day, it's like kind of slushy, because my birthday is in like December, and uh, <laughs> it just really fit, I don't know, and we both were like really impressed, like I feel like he hadn't listened to the Pumpkins in a while, so when I put this on, he was just like... He's like, they have new music? He's like, what the hell? And I was like, yeah. I was like, this this is getting pretty good. We were pretty impressed with it the first time listening to it. And I think when I bought, brought it home, I listened to it probably about like two or three more times. And when I make like little Smashing Pumpkins playlists and stuff like that, I always include like my favorite songs on here quite a bit. So I go back to it quite often and I have so many albums to listen to but and comparatively I do bring this one out a bit in terms of like my newer like last couple decades worth of albums that I have so yeah I'm very familiar with the Smashing Pumpkins obviously my mom said it was like my favorite band as a baby and I've always kind of been around their music and I know how to play a lot of their songs pretty much know most of their early output and yeah I just always been a fan there's certain albums that kind of are hit or miss for me but I always like something off of them you know there's n it's never like a complete flop for me with them no matter what their shows have always been good the lineups always been good um, they may have had their peaks and valleys but when they can come back in 2018 with something like this Great band. I gotta give five out of five. So overall rating, we got five out of five on production quality. We got four on cohesion. We got four point five on the audience. Instrumental skill and lyrical content was five out of five. And then the personal experience was five out of five. So probably going to have to give the album a 9 out of 10 for me. Granted, like I said before, 8 songs on here, not much room to, to screw up anything, honestly. And I guess Rick Rubin really had the vision going on this, so good stuff. Like, couldn't ask for more. I definitely encourage people to check this one out, especially if... I haven't listened to Seer yet, their newest album, but if you're not digging that, maybe, or if you're not digging Oceana, or some of their more recent, like, since the 2000s era stuff, like, definitely check this one out. And I mean, there's just so many earworms on this that are bound to, there's a little bit of something for everyone, I feel like. So, yeah, definitely. Show you a little bit of what I got here. There's the side there with the title. Um the back cover. If I can get that show up without a gla huge glare. Yeah. So there's that. This big, like, an angelic sort of being here. You got the, the wings kind of carrying over on the back. If I can get this to show up with all the track titles and everything. Released on Napalm Records, which I thought was pretty interesting for them, too. Because they do a lot of, uh, more edgier, hard, harder, heavier bands. Got this, the disc here. Just simple kind of stuff here. Kind of looks like it could be maybe the center of like a vinyl piece too. Such such a long <laughs> title in there. They split it across both of the things. Uh, got the little Smashing Pumpkins heart in the back. I like that logo that they've recently started adopting. It's really nice. Pretty good booklet though here. Like, show you some of the pictures, man. I just realized how awesome a lot of these graphics were in here. Got all the lyrics. Which, considering the deal I got the album on, the fact that it comes with this nice of a booklet is pretty cool. Because usually, like, it's just like an inner kind of gatefold sleeve thing. Like this. Like, it would be like just this in the. 
middle of it, but that that's awesome right there. Just great artwork. I love it. Or the book. And other band members and that kind of like chromed out thing that's going on here with the cover and everything. Really cool stuff though. You know? Love it. Glad I bought this album. Glad I realized it was coming out. And uh, like I said, encourage everyone to check it out. Smashing Pumpkins, Shiny and Oh So Bright, Volume 1. The LP, No Past, No Future, No Sun. Hoping for Volume 2, Billy. Let's freaking see it, man. Um, yeah, so let me know if you like this album. Definitely want to talk to people about all the albums I review. Let me know if there's anything else you want me to review. Any requests in the future. Definitely open to anything. Just ready to talk music with you guys. Till next time, peace and love.